Audio Story The Little Dirty Girl by Joanna Russ Read by Dalen Whaley Dear, do you like cats? I never ask you. There are all sorts of cats. Elegant, sinuous cats, clunky, heavy breathing cats, skinny desperate cats, meatloaf shaped cats, waddling dumb cats, big slobs of cats who step heavily and groan whenever they try to fit themselves. And they never do fit, under something or in between something or past something. I'm allergic to all of them. You'd think they'd know it, but as I take my therapeutic walks around the neighborhood, still aching and effortful after 10 months, though when questioned, my doctor replies with the blank baffled innocence of those Martian children, so abstractedly brilliant, they've never learned to communicate about merely human matters with anyone that my back will get better. Cats venture from alleyways, slip out from under parked cars, bound up cellar steps, prick up their ears and flash out of gardens, all lifting up their little faces, wreathing themselves around my feet, crying dependency, dependency, and showing their elegantly, needly little teeth, which they never use, save in yearning appeal to my goodness. They have perfect confidence in me, if I try to startle them by hissing, making loud noises, or clapping my hands sharply, they merely stare in interested fashion and scratch themselves with their hind legs. How nice. I've perfected a method of lifting kitties on the toe of my shoe and giving them a short ride through the air. This is supposed to be alarming. They merely come running back for more. And the children. I don't dislike children. Yes, I do. No, I don't but I feel horribly awkward with them. So of course I keep meeting them on my walks this summer. Alabaster little boys with angelic fair hair and sky colored eyes. This section of Seattle is Scandinavian and the Northwest gets very little sun. Come up to me and volunteer such compelling information as I'm going to my friend's house. I'm going to the store. My name is Marky. I wasn't really scared of that big dog. I was just startled. People leave a lot of broken glass around here. The littler ones confide. The bigger ones warn of the world's dangers. Dogs, cuts, blackberry bushes that might have been sprayed. One came up to me once. What do they see in a tall, shuffling, professional, intellectual woman of 40? And said, after a moment's thought, do you like frogs? What can I do? I said yes, so a shirt pocket that jumped and said rivet was to disclose Mervyn, an exquisite little being, the color of wet, molted sea sand, all webbed feet and amber eyes, who was then transferred to my palm where he sat and blinked. Mervyn was a toad, actually. He was barely an inch long and can be found all over Seattle, usually upside down under a rock. I'm sure he or she is a beloved Toad and Todkins and Toddle Krantz, Virginia Woolf, used in her letters to Emma Vaughn. And the girls, oh, they don't approach tall middle-aged women. Little girls are not told to talk to strangers. And the little girls of Seattle, at least in my neighborhood, are as obedient and feminine as any in the world. To the jeans and t-shirts of liberation, they, or more likely their parents, Add hair ribbons, baby-sized pocketbooks, fancy pins, pink shoes, and even toe polish. The liveliest of them I ever saw was a little person of five, coasting downhill in a red wagon, her cheeks pink with excitement, one ponytail of yellow hair undone, her white t-shirt askew, who gave a decorous little squeak of joy at the sheer speed of it. I saw and smiled. Pink cheeks saw and shrieked again, more loud and confidently this time, then looked away embarrassed, jumped quickly out of her wagon and hauled it energetically up the hill. Except for the very littlest, how neat, how clean, how carefully dressed they are, with long straight hair that the older ones, I know this, still iron under wax paper. The little dirty girl was different. She came up to me in the supermarket. I've hired to someone to do most of my shopping as I can't carry much, but I'd gone in for some little thing as I often do. 
It's a relief to get off the hard bed and away from the standing desk or the abbreviated kitchen stools I've scattered around the house, one foot up and one foot down. In fact, it's simply such a relief. Well, the little dirty girl was dirty. She was the dirtiest eight-year-old I've ever seen. Her black hair was in long tangle. Her shoes were down at heel, the laces broken, her white or rather gray socks bailing limply over her ankles. Her nose was running. Her pink dress so ancient that it showed her knees was limp and wrinkled, wrinkled and the knees themselves had been recently skinned. She looked as if she had slid halfway down Volunteer Park's steepest, dirtiest hill on her panties and then rolled end over end the rest of the way. Besides all this, there were snot and tear marks on her face, which was reddened and sallow and looked as if she had been crying. And she looked, well, what can I say, neglected. Not poor, though someone had dressed her rather eccentrically, not physically unhealthy or underfed, but messy, left alone, ignored, kicked out, bedragged like a cat caught in a thunderstorm. She looked, as I said, tear-stained, and yet came up to my shopping cart with a perfect composure and kept me calm company for a minute or so. Then she pointed to a box of Milky Way candy bars on a shelf above my head saying, I like those, in a deep, gravely voice that suggested a bad cold. I ignored the hint. No, that's wrong. It wasn't a hint. It was a merely a social adult remark, self-contained and perfectly emotionless. And if she had long ago given up expecting that telling anyone she wanted something would result in getting it. Since my illness, I've developed a fascination with sheer elastic wealth of children's bodies. The exhaustless, energetic health that they do not know that they have, in which I so acutely and utterly miss. But I wasn't for an instant tempted to feel this way about the little dirty girl. She had been through too much. She had resources. If she showed no fear of me, it wasn't because she trusted me, but because she trusted nothing. She had no expectations and no hopes. Nonetheless, she attached herself to me in my shopping cart and accompanied me down two more aisles, and there seemed to be hope in that. So I made the opening social adult remark. What's your name? A.R. Those are the initials on my handbag. I looked at her sharply, but she shared levelly back, unembarrassed, self-contained, unexpressive. I don't believe that, I said finally. I could tell you a lot of things you wouldn't believe, said the little dirty girl. She followed me up to the cashier and I was putting out my small packages one by one by one. I saw her lay out on the counter, a Milky Way bar and a nickel. The latter fetched from somewhere in that short skirted cap sleeve dress. The cashier, a middle-aged woman looked at me and I looked at her. I laid out two dimes next to the nickel. She really did want it. And I was going into the logistics of how many short trips from the car to the car and how many long ones from the car to the kitchen. The little dirty girl spoke. I can carry that, gravely and solemn. She added hoarsely, I bet I live near you. Well, I bet you don't, I said. She didn't answer, but followed me to the parking lot, one propriety hand on the cart. And when I unlocked my car door, she darted past me and started carrying packages from the cart to the front seat. I can't move fast enough to escape these children. She sat there calmly as I got in. Then she said, wiping her nose on the back of her hand, I'll help you take your stuff out when you get home. Now I know that sort of needy offer and I don't like it. Here was a little dirty girl offering to help me and smelling in close quarters as if she hadn't changed her underwear for days. Demandingness, neediness, more annoyance. Then she said in her flat crow's voice, I'll do it and go away. I won't bother you. Well, what can you do? My heart misgave me. I started the car and we drove the five minutes to my house in silence, whereupon she grabbed all the packages at once to be useful 
and some slipped back on the car seat. I think this embarrassed her, but she got my things up the stairs to the porch in only two trips and put them on the unpainted porch rocker from where I could pick them up one by one and there we stood. Why speechless? Was it honesty? I wanted to thank her, to act decent, to make that sallow face smile. I wanted to tell her to go away, that I wouldn't let her in, that I'd lock the door. But all I could think to say was, what's your name really? And the wild thing stubbornly said, A-R. And when I said, no, really, she cried, A-R. And facing me with her eyes, screwed up, shouted something unintelligible, passionate and resentful, and was off up the street. I saw her small figure turning down one of the cross streets that meets mine at the top of the hill. Seattle is gray, and against the mass storms to the north, her pink dress stood out vividly. She was going to get rained on, of course. I turned to unlock my front door, and a chunky, slow, old cat, a black and white tom called Williamson, who lives two houses down, came stiffly out from behind an azalea bush looked slit-eyed, bored about him, noticed me, his pupils dilated with instant interest, and bounded across the parking strip to my feet. Williamson is a banker cat, not really portly or dignified, but simply too lazy and unwily to bother about anything much. Either something scares him and he huffs under the nearest car and he scrooges, like all the kitties he bumbled around my ankles making steam engine noises. I turned to unlock my front door and a chunky, slow, old cat, a black and white tom called Williamson, who lives two houses down, came stiffly out from behind an azalea bush, looked slit-eyed, bored about him, noticed me, his pupils dilated with instant interest, and bounded across the parking strip to my feet. Williamson is a banker's cat, not really portly or dignified, but simply too lazy or unwildly to bother about him anything much. Either something scares him and he huffs under the nearest car, or he scrooges. Like all kitties, he bumbled around my ankles, making steam engine noises. I never feed him. I don't pet him or talk to him. I even try not to look at him. I shoved him aside with one foot and opened the front door. Williamson backed off raised his fat, jawed face, and began the old cry. Meow, meow. I booted him ungently off the porch before he could trot into my house with me. And as he slowly prepared to attack the steps, he never quite makes it, locked myself in. And the little dirty girl's last words suddenly came clear. I'll be back. Another cat. There are too many in this story, but I can't help it. The little dirty girl was trying to coax the neighbors, superbly elegant, half Siamese, out from under my car a few days later. An animal tiger mark on paws and tail, and as haughty and mysterious looking as all cats are supposed to be, though it's really only the long Siamese body and small head. Mademoiselle, her name, still occasionally leaps onto my dining room windowsill and stares in. The people who lived here before me used to feed her. I was coming back from a walk. The little dirty girl was on her knees and Mademoiselle was under the car. When the little dirty girl saw me, she stood up and Mademoiselle flashed Egyptianly through the laurel hedge and was gone. Someone had washed the little dirty girl's pink dress. Though a few days back, I'm afraid and made a half-hearted attempt to braid her hair. There were barrettes and elastics somewhere in the tangle. Her cold seemed better. When it rains in August or summer, can change very suddenly to early fall. And this was a chilly day. The little dirty girl had nothing but her mud puddle marked dress between her thin skin and the Seattle air. Her cold seemed better though, and her cheeks were pink with stooping. She said in the voice of a little girl this time and not a raven. She had blue eyes. She's Siamese, I said. What's your name? A-R. Now look, I don't. It's A-R. She was getting loud and stolid again. 
She stood there with her skinny, scabbed knees showing for her under her dress and shivered in the unconscious way kids do who are used to it. I've never seen children do it on the Lower East Side in New York because they had no winter coat in January. I said, you come in. She followed me up the steps, warily, I think, but when we got inside, her expression changed. It changed utterly. She clapped her hands and said with radiant joy, oh, they're beautiful. These were my astronomical photographs. I gave her my book of micro photographs, sails, crystals, hailstones, and went into the kitchen to put up water for tea. When I got back, she dropped the book on my old brown leather couch and was walking about with her hands clasped in front of her face and that same look of radiant joy on her face. I live in an ordinary shabby frame house that has four rooms and a finished attic. The only unusual thing about it is the number of books and pictures crammed in every which way among the mostly secondhand furniture. There are Woolworth frames for the pictures and cement block bookcases for the books. Nonetheless, the little dirty girl was as awed as if she'd found Aladdin's cave. She said, it's so sophisticated. Well, there's no withstanding that. Even if you think, what do kids know? She followed me into the kitchen where I gave her a glass of milk and a peach. She shipped and nibbled. She thought the few straggling rose bushes she could see in the back garden were wonderful. She loved my old brown refrigerator. She said, it's so big and such a color. Then she said anciently, can I see the upstairs? And got excited over the attic eaves, which were also so big, wallboard and dirty pink paint, to the point she had to run and stand under one side and then across the attic and stand under the other. She liked the view from the bedroom, the neighbor's laurel hedge and a glimpse of someone else's roof. But my study, books, a desk, a glimpse of the water, moved her so deeply and painfully that she only stood still in the center of the room, struggling with the motion, her hands again clasped in front of her. Finally, she burst out, it's so swanky. Here my kettle screamed, and when I got back, she had gotten bold enough to touch the electric typewriter. She jumped when it turned itself on, and then walked about slowly, touching the books with the tips of her fingers. She was brave and pushed the tabs on the desk lamp, though not hard enough to turn on, and boldly picked up my little mailing scale. As she did so, I saw that there were buttons missing from the back of her dress. I said, A.R., come here. She dropped the scale with a crash. I didn't mean it. Sulky again. It's not that, it's your buttons, I said. And hauled her to the study closet where I keep a band-aid box full of extras. Two were a reasonable match. Little flat top, pearlized pink things you can hardly find anymore. I sewed them onto her. Not that it helped much, and the tangles of her hair kept falling back and catching. What a force of lost barrettes and snarls of old rubber bands. I lifted it all a little grimly, remembering the pain of combing out. She sat flatly, all adoration gone. You can't comb my hair against my will. You're too weak. I wasn't going to, I said. That's what you say, the LDG pointed out. If I try, you can stop me, I said. After a moment, she turned around, flopped down on my typewriting chair, and bent her head. So I fetched my old hairbrush, which I haven't used for years, and did what I could with the upper layers, managing even to smooth out some of the lower ones. Though there were places near her neck, nearly as matted and tangled as felt, I finally had to cut some pieces out with my nail scissors. LDG didn't shriek as I used to, insisting my cries were far more artistic than those of those opera singers on the radio on Sundays, but finally asked for the comb herself and winced silently until she was decently braided with rubber bands on the ends. We put the rescue barrettes in her shirt pocket. 
Without that cloud of hair, her sallow face and pitch ball eyes looked bigger and oddly enough, younger. She was no more a wandering furry with the voice of a Northwest Coast raven, but a reasonably human, though draggly, little girl. I said, you look nice. She got up, went into the bathroom and looked at herself in the mirror. Then she said calmly, no, I don't. I look conventional. Conventional, said I. She came out of the bathroom, flipping back her new braids. Yes, I must go. And as I was wondering at her tact, for anything after this would have been anticlimax. But I shall return. That's fine, I said, but I want to have grown-up manners with you, A.R. Don't ever come here before 10 in the morning or if my car isn't here or if you can hear my typewriter going. In fact, I think you had better call me on the telephone first. That way other people do. She shook her head sweetly. She was at the front door before I could follow her, peering out. It was raining again. I saw that she was about to step out into it, and I cried, Wait, A.R., hurrying as fast as I could down the cellar steps to the garage. From where I could easily get to my car, I got from the back seat the garden plastic poncho I always keep there, and she didn't protest when I dumped it over her head and put the hood over her head. Though the poncho was much too big and even dragged on the ground in the front and back, she said, oh, it's swanky. Is it from the army? So I had the satisfaction of seeing her move up the hill as a small green tent instead of a wet pink draggle. Though with her tea party manners, she hasn't really eaten anything. The milk and peach were untouched. Was it wariness? Or did she just not like milk and peaches? Remembering our first encounter, I wrote on the pad by the telephone, which is my shopping list, Milky Way bars. And then one dozen. She came back. She never did telephone in advance. It was all right though. She had the happy faculty of somehow turning up when I wasn't working and wasn't busy and was thinking of her. But how often is an invalid busy or working? We went on walks or stayed home, and on these occasions, the business about the Milky Ways turned out to be a brilliant guest. For never have I met a child with such a passion for junk food. AR's formal disciplined politeness in front of milk or fruit was like a cat's in front of the mass-produced stuff. Faced with jam, honey, or marmalade, the ends of her braids crisp and she attacked like a cat flinging itself on a fish. I finally had to hide my own supplies in self-defense. Then on relatively good days, it was ice cream or Sara Lee cake. And on bad ones, Twinkies or Malamars, Hostess cupcakes, Three Musketeers bars, marshmallow cream, Marchino chocolates, Turkish taffy, saltwater taffy, or somewhat less horribly, Doritos, reconsisted potato chips, corn chips, pretzels, fat or thin, barbecued corn chips, or onion flavored corn chips, anything like that. She refused nuts and hated peanut butter. She also talked continuously while eating, largely in polysyllables, which made me nervous as I perpetually expected her to choke, but she never did. She got no fatter. To get her out of the house, and so away from food, I took her to an old-fashioned five and ten nearby and bought her suit shoelaces. Then I took her down to watch the local ship canal bridge open up to let a sailboat through, and we cheered. I took her to a department store just to look. I know consumerism is against your principles, she said with priggerish and mystifying accuracy and bought her a pen shaped like a ladybug. She refused to go to the zoo, an animal jail, but allowed as the rose gardens, a plant hotel, were both pleasant and educational. A ride on the zoo merry-go-round excited her to the point of screaming and running around dizzily in circles for half an hour afterwards, which embarrassed me, but then no one paid the slightest attention. I suppose shrieky little girls had happened there before, though the feminine youth of Seattle 
in its Mary Jane shoes and pink pocketbooks rather pointedly ignored her. The waterfall in the downtown park, on the contrary, sobered her up. This is a park built right on top of a crossing over one of the city's highways and is usually full of office workers. A walkway leads not only up to but actually behind the waterfall. A.R. wandered among the beds of bright flowers and passed, stooping behind the water, trying to stick her hand in the falls. She came out saying, It looks like an old man's beard! pointing to one of the ragged skid row men who was sleeping on the grass in the rare northern sunlight. Then she said, no, it looks like a lady's dress without any seams. Once, feeling we had become friends enough for it, I ran her bath and put her clothes through the basement washer dryer. Her splashings and yellings in the bathroom were terrific. And afterwards, she flashed nude about the house, hanging out of windows, embellishing her strange, rashes shouts with violent jerkings and boundings about that I think were meant for dancing. She even ran out the back door naked and had circled the house before I, voiceless with calling, AR, come back here, had presence of mind enough to lock both the front and back doors after she dashed in and before she could get out again to make the entire tour de Seattle in her Jaybird suit. Then I had to get her back in that tired pink dress, which, when I ironed it, had finally given up completely, despite the dryer, and sagged in two sizes too big for her, unless AR was youthifying. I got her into her too large pink dress, her baggy underwear, her too, her too large shoes, her new pink socks, which I had bought for her, and said, AR, where do you live? Crisp and shining, the little clean girl replied, my dear, you always ask me that. And you never answer, said I. Oh, yes, I do, said the little clean girl. I live up the hill and under the hill and over the hill and behind the hill. That's no answer, said I. Woof mumble. She said through a Mars bar. And then, more intelligibly, if you knew, you wouldn't want me. I would so. LDG, now LCG regarded me thoughtfully. She scratched her ear getting, as I noticed, chocolate in her hair. She was a fast worker. She said, you want to know? You think you ought to know? You think you have a right? When I leave, you'll wait until I'm out of sight and then you'll follow me in the car. You'll sneak by the curb way behind me so I won't notice you. You'll wait until I climb the steps of a house, like that big yellow house with the fuchsias in the yard where you think I live and you'll watch me go in. And then you ring the bell, and when the lady comes to the door, you'll say, Your little daughter and I have become friends. But the lady will say, I haven't got any little daughter. And then you'll know I fooled you, and you'll get scared, so don't try. Well, she had me dead to rights. Something very like that had been in my mind. Her face was pernaturally grave. She said, You think I'm too small? I'm not. You think I'll get sick if I keep on eating like this? I won't. If you think if you bought a whole department store for me, it would be enough, it wouldn't. I won't. Well, I can't get a whole department store for you, I said. She said, I know. Then she got up and tucked the box of Mars bars under one arm, throwing over the other my green plastic poncho, which she always carried about with her now. I'll get you anything you want, I said. No, not what you want, A.R., but anything you really, truly need. You can't, said the little dirty girl. I'll try. She crossed the living room to the front door, dragging the poncho across the rug, not paying the slightest attention to the astronomical photographs that had so enchanted her before. Too young now, I suppose. I said, A.R., I'll try. Truly, I will. She seemed to consider it a moment, her small head to one side. Then she said briskly, I'll be back, and was out the front door, and I did not, would not, could not, did not dare to follow her. Was this the moment I decided I was dealing with a ghost? No, long before. Little by little, I suppose, her clothes were a dead giveaway. For one thing, always the same, and the kind no child had worn since the end of the Second World War. 
Then there was the book I had given her on her first visit, which had somehow closed and straightened itself on the coffee table. Another I had lent her, the poems of Edda Millet, which had mysteriously been there a day afterwards. The eerie invisibility of a naked little girl hanging out of my windows and yelling, the inconspicuousness of a little twirling girl, nobody noticed spinning round and shrieking outside the merry-go-round. A dozen half conspicuous glimpses I've had every time I've gotten in or out of my car of the poncho lying on the back seat where I always kept it. Folded as always, the very dust on it undisturbed, and her unchildlike cleverness in never revealing either her name or where she lived. And as surely as AR had been a biggish eight when we had met weeks ago, just as surely she was now a smallish, very unmistakable, unnaturally knowledgeable five. But she was such a nice little ghost and so solid. Ghosts don't run up your grocery bills, do they? Or trample cheese doodles in your carpet or leave gum under your kitchen chair. Leave smears of chocolate on the surface of the table. AR had an exceptionally dirty ring around the inside of the tub, along with three, count them, three, large, dirty, sopping wet bath towels on the bathroom floor. If AR's social and intellectual life had a tendency to become intangible when looked at carefully, everything connected with her digestive system and her bodily dirt stuck around amazingly. There was the state of the bathroom, the dishes in the sink, many more than mine, and the ironing board still up in the study for the ironing of AR's dress, with the spray starch container still set up on one end and the scorch mark where she decided to play the iron. If she was a ghost, she was a good one and I liked her and wanted her back. Whatever help she needed from me in resolving her ancient Seattle tragedy, ancient ever since 1942, she would have. I wondered for a moment if she were connected with the house, but the people before me, the original owners, hadn't had children. The house itself hadn't even been built until the mid-50s. Nothing in the neighborhood had, unless both they and I were being haunted by the children which hadn't had. Could I write them a psychotherapeutic letter about it? Dear Miss X, how's your inner space? I went to the bathroom and discovered that AR had relieved herself interestingly in the toilet and had then not flushed it. Hardly what I would call poetical behavior on the part of somebody's unconscious. So I flushed it. I picked up the towels one by one and dragged them to the laundry basket in the bedroom. If the little dirty girl was a ghost, she was obviously a bodily dirt and needs ghost traumatized in life by never having given a proper bath or allowed to eat marshmallows until she got sick. Maybe this was it, and now she could rest, scrubbed and full of Mars bars in peace. But I hope not. I was nervous. I had made a promise, I'll give you what you need, that a few of us can make to anyone, a frightening promise to make to anyone. Still, I hoped, and she was a business-like little ghost, she would come back, for she too had promised. Autumn came. I didn't see the little dirty girl. School started and I spent days trying to teach freshmen and fresh women not to write like Rod McCoon. Neither of us really knowing why they shouldn't actually. While advanced students pursued me down the halls with thousand page trilogies, demands for independent study, and other unspeakables. As a friend of ours said once, everyone will continue to pile responsibility on a woman and everything and everyone must be served except oneself. I've been a flogged horse professionally long enough to know that. And meanwhile, the dishes stay in the sink and the kindly wild elves do not come out of the woodwork at night and do them. I was exercising two hours a day and sleeping 10. The little dirty girl seemed to have vanished with the summer. Then one day, there was a freak smell of summer weather and that evening a thunderstorm. This is a very rare thing in Seattle. The storm didn't last, of course, but it seemed to bring right after it the first of the winter rains, cold, drenching, ominous. I was grading papers that evening when someone knocked at my door. I thought I left the garage light on and my neighbor come out to tell me. So I yelled, just a minute, please. Dropped my pen, wondered whether I should pick it up, decided to hell with it, and went exasperated to the door. It was the little dirty girl. She was as wet as I'd ever seen a human be and had a bad cough. 
my poncho must have given heaven knows where, and water squealing in her shoes. She was shivering violently and her fingers were blue. It could not have been more than 50 degrees out. And her long baggy dress clung to her with water running off of it. There was a puddle already forming around her feet on the rug. Her teeth were chattering. She stood there shivering and glowering miserably at me, from time to time emitting that deep, painful chest cough, sometimes here in adults who smoke too much. I thought of hot baths, towels, electric blankets, aspirin. Can ghosts get pneumonia? For God's sake, get your clothes off, I said. But A.R. stepped back against the door, shivering, and wrapped her starved arms in her long, wet skirt. No, she said in a deep voice more like a crow's than ever. Like this. Like what, I said helplessly, thinking of my back and how incapable I was of dragging a resistant five-year-old anywhere. You hate me, croaked A.R. You starve me. You do. You won't let me eat anything. Then she edged past me, still coughing, her dark eyes ringed with blue, her skin molted with bruises, and her whole body shaking with cold and anger like a mask of Medusa. She screamed, You want to clean me up because you don't like me. You like me clean because you don't like me dirty. You hate me, so you won't give me what I need. You won't give me what I need, and I'm dying. I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. Then she was interrupted by coughing. I said, A.R. And she screamed again, her whole body bending convulsively, the cords in her neck standing out. Her scream was choked by phlegm, and she beat herself with her fist. Then wrapping her arms in her wet skirt, then another bout of coughing, she said in gas, I couldn't get into your house to use the bathroom, so I had to shit in my pants. I had to stay out in the rain. I got cold. All I get from you, and you won't get it. Then tell me what you need, I said, and A.R. raised her horrid little face to mine, a picture of venomous, uncontrolled misery of sheer demanding starvation. You, she whispered. So that was it. I thought of the pleading cats whose open mouths, dependency, dependency, reveal needle teeth which can rip off your thumb. Imagine the little dirty girl sinking her teeth into my chest if I so much as touched her. Not touch for bathing or combing or putting on shoelaces, you understand, but for touching only. I saw, I don't know what, her skin ash gray, the bones of her little skull coming through her skin worse and worse every moment. And I knew she would kill me if she didn't get what she wanted. Though she was suffering far worse than I was and was more innocent, a demon's child is still a child with a child's needs after all. I got down on one knee so as to be nearer her size and saying only, my back, be careful of my back, held out my arms so that the terror of the ages could walk onto them. She was truly gray now, her bones very prominent. She was starving to death. She was dying. She gave the cough of a cavador breathing its last, a filmy wheeze with a dreadful rattle in it. And then the little dirty girl walked right into my arms and began to cry. I felt her crying right up from her belly. She was cold and stinky and extremely dirty and afflicted with the most surprising hit cough. I rocked her back and forth and mumbled, I don't know what. But what I meant was that I thought she was fine, that all of her was fine. Her shit, her piss, her sweat, her tears, her scabby knees, the snot on her face, her cough, her dirty panties, her bruises, her desperation, her anger, her whims. All of her was wonderful. I loved all of her and I would do my best to take good care of her, all of her, forever and ever and then a day. She bawled, she howled, she pinched me hard. She yelled, why did it take you so long? She fussed violently over her panties and said she had been humiliated. Though it turned out when I got her to the bathroom that she was making an awfully big fuss over a very little brown stain. I put the panties to soak in the kitchen sink and the little dirty girl likewise in a hot tub with vast mounds of rose scented bubble bath, which turned up from somewhere. Though I knew perfectly well I hadn't bought any in years. We had a shrieky, tickly, soapy, toe grabby sort of bath, a very wet one during which I got soaked. I told her about my back and she was careful. We sang to the loofah. We threw water at the bathroom tiles. We lost the soap. 
We came out warm in a huge towel, I'd swear mine aren't that big, and screamed gaily again to exercise our lungs from which the last bit of cough had disappeared. We said, oh, floof, there goes the soap. We spectated loudly and at length on the possible subjective emotional life of the porcelain sink, American variety, and rather to my surprise, sang snatches of the Messiah as follows. Every malted shall be exalted, and behold and see, behold and see, if there were air pajama, like to this pajama, and so on. My last memory of the evening is of tucking the little dirty girl into one side of my bed in my pajamas, which had to be rolled up and pinned even to stay on her, and then climbing into the other side myself. The bed was wider than usual, I suppose. She said sleepily, can I stay? And I also sleep really forever. But in the morning, she was gone. Her clothes lasted a little longer, which worried me as I had visions of AR committing flashery around and about the neighborhood. But in a few days, they too had faded into mist or the elemental particles of time or whatever ghost and ghost clothes are made of. The last thing I saw of hers was a shoe with a new heel. Oh yes, I had gotten them fixed, which rolled out from under the couch and lasted a whole day before it became, I forget what, the shadow of one of the ornamental teacups on the mantel, I think. And so there was no more five-year-old AR beating on the door and demanding to be let in on rainy nights, but that's not the end of the story. As you know, I've never gotten along with my mother. I've always supposed that neither of us knew why. In my childhood, she had vague, long, drawn-out symptoms, which I associated with early menopause. I was a late baby. Then she put me through school, which was a strain on her librarian's budget and a strain on my sense of independence and my sense of guilt. And always there was her timidity, her fears of everything under the sun, her terrified, preoccupied air of always being somewhere else, and what I can only call her furtiveness, the feeling I've always had of some secret life going on in her, which I could never ask about or share. Add this to my father's death somewhere in prehistory, I was too, and then that ghastly behavior psychologists call the game of happy families. I mean the perpetual absolute incidence on how happy we all are that even aunts, uncles, and cousins rush to heap on my already bitter and most unhappy shoulders. And you'll have some idea of what's been going on for the last I don't know how many years. Well, this is the woman who came to visit a few weeks later. I wanted to dodge her. I had been dodging academic committees, students, and proper bedtimes. Why couldn't I dodge my mother? So I decided that this time I would be openly angry. I'd been doing that in school too. Only there was nothing to be angry about this time. Maybe it was the weather. It was one of those clear, still times we sometimes have in October. Warm, the leaves not down yet. That in and out sunshine coming through the clouds and the northern sun so low that the masses of orange pyracantha berries on people's brick walls and the walls themselves are anything that color flame indescribably. My mother got in from the airport in a taxi. I still can't drive far. And we walked about a bit. And then I took her to Kent and Hallaby's downtown, that expensive old fashioned place that all mirrors and sawdust floors and old fashioned white tablecloths and waiters. Also waitresses now with floor length aprons. It was very self indulgent of me, but she had been so much better, or I had been, it doesn't matter. She was 70, and if she wanted to be fussy and furtive and act like a thin old guinea hen with secret dispatches from the CIA, I've called her worse things. I felt she had the right. Besides, there was no worse than flogging myself through five women's work and endless depressions, beating the old plow horse day after day for weeks and months and years, no, for decades, until her back broke and she thundered and went down and all I could do was curse at her helplessly and beat her the more. All this came to me in Kent and Halby's. Luckily, my mother squeaked as we sat down. There's a reason. If you sit at a corner table in Kent and Halby's, and see your face where the mirrored walls come together. Well, it's complicated, but briefly you can see yourself. 
for the only time in your life as you look to other people. An ordinary mirror reverses the right and left sides of your face, but this odd arrangement re reflects them so they're back in place. People are shocked when they see themselves. I had planned to warn her. She said bewildered. What's that? But rather intrigued too, I think. Picture a small, thin, white-haired, extremely prim ex-librarian worn to her fine bones, but still ready to take alarm and run away at a moment's notice. That's my mother. I explained about the mirrors, and then I said, people don't really know what they look like. It's only an idea people have that you recognize yourself if you saw yourself across the room. Any more than we can hear our own voices, you know, it's because longer frequencies travel so much better through the bones of your head than they can through the air. That's why a tape recording of your voice sounds higher than, I stopped. Something was going to happen. A hurricane was going to smash Kent and Halby's flat. I had spent almost a whole day with my mother, walking around my neighborhood, showing her the university, showing her my house, and nothing in particular had happened. Why should anything happen now? She said, looking me straight in the eye, you've changed. I waited. She said, I'm afraid that we, you and I were not, are not a happy family. I said nothing. I would have a year ago. It occurred to me that I might for years have confused my mother's primness with my mother's self-control. She went on. She said, when you were five, I had cancer. I said, what? You had what? Cancer, said my mother calmly, in a voice still as low and decorous as if she had been discussing her new beige handbag or Kent and Halby's long fancy menu, which lay open on the table between us. I kept it from you. I didn't want to burden you. Burden. I've often wondered, she went on a little flustered. They say now, but of course no one thought that way then. She went on more formally. It takes years to know if it has spread or will come back even now, and the doctors knew very little then. I was all right eventually, of course, but by that time you were almost grown up and had become a very capable and self-sufficient little girl, and then later on you were so successful. She added, you didn't seem to want me. Want her? Of course not. What would you feel about a mother who disappeared like that? Would you trust her? Would you accept anything from her? All those years of terror and secrecy. Maybe she thought she was being punished by having cancer. Maybe she thought she was going to die. Too scared to give anything and everyone. Being loudly secretive and then being faced with a daughter who wouldn't be questioned, wouldn't be kissed, wouldn't be touched, who kept her room immaculate, who didn't want her mother and made no bones about it, and who kept her fury and betrayal and her misery to herself and her schoolwork excellent. I could say only the silliest thing right out of the movies. Why are you telling me all this? She said simply, why not? I wish I could go on to describe a scene of intense and affectionate reconciliation between my mother and myself, but that did not happen, quite. She put her hand on the table, and I took it, feeling I don't know what. For a moment, she squeezed my hand and I smiled. got up then, and she stood too, and we embraced. Not at all as I had embraced the little dirty girl, though with the same pain at heart, but awkwardly and only for a moment as such things really happen. I said to myself, not yet, not so fast, not right now. Wondering if we looked in Kent and Halby's mirrors the way we really were. We were both embarrassed, I think, but that too was all right. We sat down, soon, sometime, not quite yet. The dinner was nice. The next day I took her for breakfast to the restaurant that goes around and gives you a view of the whole city and then to the public market and then on a ferry. We had a pleasant, affectionate, quiet two days and then she went back east. We have been writing each other lately. For the first time in years, more than the obligatory birthday and holiday cards and a few remarks about the weather. And she sent me old family photographs, talked about being a widow, 
and being misdiagnosed for years, that's what it seems now, and about all sorts of old things. My father, my being in the school play in second grade, going to summer camp, getting moss to sit on her finger, all sorts of things. And the little dirty girl, enclosed in her photograph, we were passing a photographer's studio near the university the other day, and she was seized with a passionate fancy to have her picture taken. I suspect the tarot cards and the live owl in the window had something to do with it. So in we went. She clamors for a lot lately, and I try to provide it. Flattens her nose against a bakery window, and we argue about whether she'll settle for the current bun instead of a donut. Wants to stay up late and read and sing to herself, so we do. Screams for parties, so we find them. And at parties impels me towards people I would probably not have noticed, or if I had, liked a year ago. She's a surprisingly generous and good little soul, and I'd be lost without her, so it's turned out all right in the end. Besides, no one ignores her at one's peril. I try not to. Mind you, she has taken some odd, good things out of my life. Little boys seldom walk with me now, and I've perfected, though regretfully, a more empathetic method of kitty booting, which they seem to understand. At least one of them turned to me yesterday with a look of disgust that said clearer than words. Good heavens! how you've degenerated. Don't you know there's nothing more in life important than taking care of me? About the picture, you may think it odd. You may even think it's not her. You're wrong. The pitchball eyes and thin face are there, all right. But what about the bags under her eyes? The deep down your lines about her mouth, the strange color of her short cut hair, it's gray. What about her astonishing air of being so much older, so much more intellectual, so much more professional, so much more well competent than any little dirty girl could possibly be. Well, faces change when 40 odd years fall into the developing fluid. And you've always said that you wanted, that you must have, that you commanded, that you begged, and so on and so on in your interminable circulatory style that the one thing you desired most in the world was a photograph. A photograph, your kingdom for a photograph of me. The end. In the story, The Little Dirty Girl, the little dirty girl could represent and bring up trauma from the narrator's mother because she pretty much raised herself and she's scared that if she had a child, she would neglect it like she was neglected as a child. So one part in the story where this is displayed is when she was talking about how she never got along with her mother and that neither of them knew why. And her mother found out that she had cancer and she didn't tell her daughter because her daughter wanted nothing to do with her. So that was one of the big things. And the second place where this could be displayed was when she was giving the little dirty girl a bath and the little dirty girl was very violently fussing over her underwear and about giving her a bath and she was embarrassed and it was also a good thing because her mother never she never did that with her so it was kind of like a how the little dirty girl represents what she didn't have of her mother bathing her and taking a bath with her and caring for her and being with her.